Battlefield 5 Rotterdam gameplay. I can now show you brand new content that I know you're all eager to see. Finally, something that's not Arctic Fjord on Conquest. A big thanks to EA for having me out to Gamescom so that I could capture this footage. The gameplay you're watching is from a build specifically made for Gamescom, but it is extremely close to the open beta build. A few more tweaks are likely to make it into the beta that weren't present in this build, but for all intents and purposes, this is what you're going to be getting access to in early September. This is PC gameplay. It's set up on a beefy rig, an i7 processor, 16GB of RAM, and a GTX 1080 Ti, but there was a chance to play the game on Xbox One on the show floor as well and speaking of the Xbox one there is a special edition Battlefield 5 console being released close to launch here it is it's called gold rush it's got this lovely gold to gray fade on the top panel and it comes with the deluxe version of Battlefield 5 and a copy of Battlefield 1943 as well so that's two World War 2 Battlefield games that you can play if you want to find out more about the bundle I've popped a link down below in the description click that and it will take you to the Xbox website but down to business. I'm sure you guys are all interested in just seeing Rotterdam gameplay, but there are a lot of changes that has happened to Battlefield 5 since the closed alpha, and I'm going to try and tell you about all of those in this video as well. But I will start off with a quick explanation of the map so you guys can sort of get a feel for it. It's your classic urban battlefield map. It combines ground vehicles and infantry combat into just this melting pot of alleyways, roads, tight corridors, and open spaces, all resulting in some really fast-paced, chaotic action. You've got that raised metro line above the rest of the map. That really defines the vertical gameplay on offer. And actually, on the far side of the map towards the bridge that juts out over the water, there are actually crashed metro trains that connect to the surrounding buildings. So that bridge is actually a viable option to traverse the entire width of the Rotterdam map. Plenty of the buildings on the map are enterable, but not all of them are, which is a good thing, and let me explain why. If every building was enterable, you'd not only see a breakdown in gameplay, with players just hiding everywhere, gameplay would really, really slow down, but you'd also likely see a massive drop in performance, with more assets needing to be loaded onto the map every single time you play. Now, this building hadn't had a pass on highlighting which doors and windows could be opened and destroyed, but that's something I've had confirmed will be looked at moving forward. So if you see anything in the gameplay where I try and open a door and I can't do it, then you'll absolutely know why. Comparing this map to previous urban Battlefield maps, this really is a love child of Sen Crossing from Battlefield 3 and Amiens from Battlefield 1. It's got the visual theming of Amiens, but the map flow and structure of Sen Crossing. This time, though, there are more routes and options for players to take than what Amiens offered. The Sea Flag, for example, it's this courtyard hidden within a surrounding wall of tall houses. It has seven different entrance points scattered through the buildings that surround it. Some of them are archways, in from the roads beyond, some are doorways, and some of them are just simply gaps between buildings. So there's plenty of variety there that you can use. And of course, some of those are blockable with the fortification system in the map as well, which has been highly upgraded since the closed alpha. Overall, the map is just classic urban warfare. If you like those kind of maps in previous Battlefield games, then you're going to absolutely love Rotterdam. Now, speaking briefly there of the fortification system, let's give you guys some details about how that's really changed. The system was debuted in the closed alpha with the Narvik map. Certain sections of that map showed off fortifications better than others, and you did have the chance to build some really cool trenches in some of the extremities of the map. But outside of that, most of the fortifying was fairly simple, in my opinion. Things have really been stepped up here on Rotterdam, and considering this is still an unfinished map, the fortifications aren't done either. There's more to come here. Now, some of the highlights are a completely transformable flag and the ability to reconstruct bridges that have been destroyed. Let's start out with that flag. It's the A flag here on Rotterdam. This is capturable from the metro line above 
and the floor below, but the floor below is almost completely devoid of cover at the start of a round, and it's really up to you to build that cover for yourself. An entire sandbag structure can be built in parts, wall by wall, to create this contained area on the floor that encircles the capture zone and the ammo station that's placed down there as well. And this means that every single time you approach the flag, it's likely going to have changed in some way. The first team to reach it in the matches I played often built a few walls to pass the time you were capping the flag, but as the match wore on, more and more objects would appear under the metro bridge as you went back to the flag to capture it every single time. And those were both placed there by both teams to give them more cover. It's a really, really cool mechanic, and it certainly shows off the power of having fortifications in Battlefield 5. It changes the gameplay completely every time you go back to the flag. Now the bridges, they're even cooler in my opinion. There are a few small canal bridges on the map that are made of stone. These can be destroyed with rockets, mines, tank shells, any explosives really with enough force behind them. And when they're up, these act as pathways for infantry and vehicles to get across the map. And if they're destroyed, they really can disrupt the flow. And that creates interesting gameplay in itself. If a tank can't get across the canal, that might give you a little bit of advantage to get to another flag that the tank can't get. I'd say you need to think of these bridges as heavy fortifications, just the same way that only certain players can construct machine gun turrets and AA cannons in certain locations. Here, you're going to spend quite a bit of time rebuilding a bridge if you do it on your own. First of all, you construct the metal side frames, then you construct the metal base, which comes in two parts, then you add wooden slatting on top of the base, and finally, you add wooden slatting to the sides of the bridge, which can be used by infantry to get across if they don't want to use the middle of the bridge. And then, ta-da, you have a bridge that now you can get over if you want to. It'll take well over a minute to create the bridge on your own, but a couple of support players, which can build fortifications quicker than other classes, can get it done much faster, and potentially that opens up another path for vehicles again. If the bridge is destroyed, the vehicles have to find another way across the canals, unless the driver wants to get out and try and build the bridge themselves, and then obviously you risk somebody stealing the vehicle that you were sitting in. Now infantry, of course, they can just jump down into the water and swim across if they want to, or if you aim correctly, you can jump from one side of the broken bridge to the other, and you can actually grab onto the ledge with one arm that's left behind, and then you can pull yourself up which is a really, really cool gameplay moment. I managed to pull it off a couple of times when I was playing, and it, it was definitely a cool moment that I didn't fall down into the water and have to find a ladder to get myself out of the canal. Further around the map, there are, of course, hundreds of other places that you can build fortifications. You've got sandbag walls, lumps of metal, lumps of wood to provide cover. Those can block different routes around the map. You can reinforce defenses around flags. And in general, you're just changing the way the map flows every time you build something. Now, one area right now that you cannot fortify is the White House. That's the B flag. That hasn't had a fortifications pass yet, at least not in the Gamescom build, but I have been assured by devs that this is an area that will be finished later on. Now, in the gameplay behind, I'm sure you've noticed me using some new weapons that have been added to Battlefield 5. We will have plenty more weapons to play with in the open beta, with new choices in every single class. There are some new gadgets and a new secondary weapon as well. Starting off with the Assault class, this has seen some major change since the closed alpha. The entire class has been rebalanced towards mid-range combat, and in the process, it stole the Gewehr 43 from the Medic class. The now infamous STG is still in there, alongside the M1A1 Carbine and the Turner's SMLE. That's a semi-automatic conversion of the Lee-Enfield bolt-action rifle. Now, rather than using the closed Alpha 2 balancing model for the STG and reducing its effectiveness at range, DICE has instead chosen to embody the Alpha 1 balancing and then rebuild the Assault class around that mid-range power, which I personally don't see as a bad thing. The explosive gadgets, especially the shoulder flyer rocket launchers, they work best at a little bit further than close range, a safe distance from danger, so having weapons to deal with straggling infantry at mid-range makes sense to me. 
The Medic class has also been rebalanced for the open beta, taking on more of a close range role, which I think is much more in keeping with the new reviving and healing mechanics of Battlefield 5. Now with revive animations being properly physical, the emphasis of clearing the area before you revive somebody is greater than ever, and so having weapons that suit that close range clearance role is exactly what the medic has gotten. SMGs are the order of the day now with the EMP, the Suomi, the MP40 and the Sten. Each of these performs differently from others with the EMP and the Suomi being faster rate of fire weapons and the MP40 and the Sten being more controllable, slower rate of fire weapons. The medic class also got a big buff with DICE applying the syringe gadget permanently to the soldier but not letting it take up a gadget slot. This means you can now revive fallen players and equip a healing gadget along with another gadget as well. That is a really big buff to the medic class. It kind of makes up for the fact that any class can now revive other players in their squad via the buddy revive system and that all soldiers can now hold a medical pouch if they pick one up. I should probably explain how that works. This build of Battlefield 5 introduces a new mechanic that allows any soldier to hold onto a medical pouch should they pick one up from a medical crate, a supply station or be thrown one by a medic soldier. This means at any point where you don't have 100 health you can apply the pouch and get yourself back up to 100. It could be that you take a few hits during a gunfight and you need to take cover. Behind cover you can apply the pouch and regen your health, potentially allowing you to take a few more hits again when you come out of cover and engage in the gunfight. It's a system I actually enjoyed using and picking up medical pouches became a gameplay action that I sought to do whenever I got the opportunity. Whether you have a pouch in the slot or not, that is displayed next to the health bar in the middle of the screen at the bottom. Now this will be active during the open beta so it's worth taking some time to learn the system and if you have any feedback on it, stick it in the forums and let the developers know. I know that they do want feedback on this system because it is a big change over what was available in the closed alpha. Moving on to the support class, this is largely unchanged from the closed alpha, but it does include more weapons for you to try out. We have the SIG KE7, this is a slow rate of fire controllable light machine gun that offers good power in the mid range if you can get the bursting of automatic fire just right. We've got the FG42, a much faster firing, more erratic rifle that only features a 20 round box magazine. The recoil is controllable but in very short bursts unless you're at close range where likely your target is going to be much larger in your sights. This was my favourite weapon of all of the new weapons added to the open beta and it competes closely with the STG as a versatile mid-range weapon. Then we have the Bren, this was a alpha weapon so we'll glide right past that and onto the M30 drilling triple barrel shotgun. This thing is an absolute beast. The third rifle barrel under the two shotgun barrels is deadly if you can utilize the iron sights to their fullest, fullest extent. I knocked a few players in one shot to the head and to the body I was doing about 60-ish damage if I remember correctly. This closes the gap a little bit for the support class but it keeps the weapon as a mid-range option because of that rifle barrel. This is extremely satisfying to use when you switch to the rifle barrel. And finally, on to the Scout class. Here we get two new weapons to use, the Lee Enfield Mark IV No. 1 and the ZH-29 alongside the Car 98 that we used in the closed alpha. Now the ZH-29 is a semi-automatic rifle of Czech Slovak origin and was used by the Chinese Revolutionary Army, but in Battlefield 5 at the moment it is a monster weapon. I wish I had more footage to show you, but unfortunately my footage of this weapon corrupted. I'm really upset about that. It does a minimum 52 damage, making it a two-shot kill at any range, and it has five rounds in a magazine, so there's potential for taking down two or three players per magazine if you manage to land a headshot in there, which is just utterly insane. I wholeheartedly agree with the rest of the people who I played with at Gamescom that this thing needs another look, because it was way too easy to kill people with it, and I can already see day one videos of Battlefield 5 saying this thing is the god gun, because right now this thing is just obscene.
Now, besides classes and weapons, there are a few smaller mentions that I want to make here about this Gamescom build, which represents the closed alpha, so I'll fire these off quickly for you now. First of all, a brand new enemy suppressed HUD icon has been added to the game. It's a small red diamond that appears above the suppressed player's head and slowly fades upwards after a second or so, and it appears for every player suppressed by your gunfire. You might have noticed it a couple of times in the background, it's hard to notice during gameplay when you're watching it, but when you're actually playing the game it is fairly obvious, but it disappears quite quickly so it doesn't clutter the HUD. The Assault and Medic classes get access to the SMLE Grenade Launcher that we saw in the Rotterdam trailer. New revive timers for both the Medic and Buddy revives are active now, both taking a shorter amount of time than they did in the Alphas. If you double tap the crouch button, your soldier will slide. This is a change from the single tap that you needed to do in Battlefield 1, and the slide is far less abusable here in Battlefield 5. You now get two options on the bleed out screen. You can either bleed out or you can cling to life, speeding up or slowing down the timer. If you do nothing, a steady timer leads to eventually you bleeding out as well. So you can now choose what you want to do depending on the situation or if medics aren't around to revive you. The dragging of down soldiers that wasn't active in the Gamescom build, so at this stage some of the physical reviving emphasis is kind of lost when the player is out in the open and cannot be moved to a safe place first. Weapon cosmetic customization was shown off with some weapons having up to seven different parts that you could change the look of, which is awesome. More choice for the player. And finally, there was no player or vehicle customization in the Gamescom build either. And so, there you have it, just about everything you need to know and your first look at the Rotterdam map coming to Battlefield 5. Thank you very much for watching today, and if you stay tuned to the channel tomorrow, maybe even later this evening, I'll be dropping some more footage. This time it's going to be raw footage of four of the brand new weapons, so you can really get an understanding for how they play. Leave me some comments down below letting me know what you think of all this new information and the Rotterdam map as well, and I'll try and read as many as I can. Make sure you subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on, that way you won't miss any of my future Battlefield 5 videos. But until next time, my name is Westy, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.